I've been thinking about what to write for today's opening, and I've been watching a lot of Christian content to try and find ideas that I want to address. But I've come stuck. The reason why I've come stuck is it's the same utter nonsense every time. Whether it's the alleged top-tier apologist like Cliff Neckler, who, by the way, someone suggested, if you think he's that bad, why don't you debate him? To which I responded, if you'll lay the funding down, I will. Never heard a response. So the first time TikTok apologists to the appalling excuse makers who preach and run in our video comments section, all I hear is nonsense. I can't even bring myself to call them arguments because much of the time they're just statements with nothing to back them up. Have Christians run out of arguments? Is it so overwhelmingly obvious, even to the converted, that there is no evidence of God's existence? that apologetics has turned into preaching at people rather than having conversations with them? Because, you know, we don't want to be humiliated in public now, do we? Do you disagree? Do you think there are compelling arguments and evidence of God's existence? And are you willing to put your money where your mouth is? Or are you going to be like the many? Jeffrey, who claimed that his sole motivation was to reach as many non-Christians as possible? then said he wouldn't call a show with thousands of views in favour of commenting on a clip with less than a thousand. Or Ronald, who claims that he has scientific evidence for God and has been repeatedly invited to call for the last five months, always finds an excuse. Got family over this week. Oh, I thought it started at a different time this week. You, Christians, the gobby ones that talk a good game, call us. Represent or step aside. I don't care if you converted last week or you consider yourself the world's greatest apologist. Dr. Ben and I are waiting for you to step up and soon. So give us a call because the show is about to begin. Welcome, everybody. It is April 14th, 2024. I'm your host, Dr. Ben, and with me, we have my favorite, Richard Gilliver. How are you doing today, Richard? I am literally the only Richard Gilliver he knows. <laughs> yes, no yes. It, it's like, it's, <laughs> yeah, you know, I gotta say something to keep my friendship with Richard. So, you know, the best thing I can come up with is my favorite, Richard Gilliver, the one and only Richard Gilliver, at least that I know, uh, like he said. But, um, it sounds like Richard's a little bit angry today, um, and it sounds like a lot of people in the uh, the pre-show TikTok were uh, saying that they were going to call in, and we'll see we'll see if they do. Um, but anyway, today is Sunday, April fourteenth, twenty twenty four. Like I said, we are Talk Heathen. We are a product of the Atheist Community of Austin, a five hundred one c three nonprofit organization dedicated to the pr promotion of atheism, critical thinking, secular humanism, and the separation of religion and government. And like we were saying, this is a call-in show. We want especially people who believe in the supernatural or who follow a religion. Tell us what you believe and why. Um, we have open lines right now, so call 512-991-9242, or you can go to your computer at tiny.cc slash call th and that's another way that you can get in we want to hear your thoughts we're looking for somebody to convince us that god is real um, and i know there are plenty of people out there that keep saying that he is and we want to know why you believe that so get in your calls we're ready to talk to you today is a perfect day to uh maybe convert some atheists um but while we're letting those calls come in uh, we're going to do our Talk Heathen to Me segment. Um, so we're going to read the question from last week, which was, what is God doing with all those foreskins? And we're going to tell you our top three answers. So in third place, we have from Toughen Up Fluffy 7294 says, God wants all the foreskins back because they're on recall due to safety concerns. <laughs> Yeah, you've got to watch them foreskins. You don't know. You don't know how dangerous it will be. If, to be fair, if they're if they're very elastic and you let go of one end, you could be yourself an injury in the eye. No problem at all. So, you know, it is very realistic that one. Yeah, no, that was a really really good one. Uh, and number two is 
Orin Arielli, God is a practical and frugal deity. He collected foreskins and a leather worker, uh, and had a leather leather worker create him a wallet that turns into a briefcase when rubbed just right. <laughs> It's for efficiency, you know. You can't. That, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I gotta make sure I can worker. store things. <laughs> I may have to make a suggestion. <laughs> that's a good that's one. Brilliant. And then number one from Rick Reasons with the Z. The Z is important. What does God want with all the foreskins? What do you think Angel's food cake is made of? Which that may have just ruined Angel's food cake for me. But I mean, yeah. the shape. The shape is one thing. So. <laughs> I don't know. Do with that what you will. Um, but all those were incredibly good this week. I'm excited to see what you all come up with for next week. Um, so if you want to respond and get your name on the show next week, you can go to the comment section after the show. So not, not the live chat during the show, the comment section after the show and leave your response. And we're going to go through and find our top three responses and read them out on the air. So the question for this week is, what was the sin that made God flood the earth? And I really like this question. I'm very excited. So if you have an answer to that, leave it in the comments and we'll reveal if you are one of the top three answers next week. Richard, what is your answer to this question? What was the sin that made God flood the entire earth? I'm just interested if we're going to be revealing it from behind an elasticated foreskin. <laughs> uh, look, everybody, everybody knows that those scholarly types know that uh, sin is that which displeases God. So the obvious answer to me is that people were just being nice, friendly, giving each other gifts, being nice to each other, being loving to each other, caring, good, good people. But did not include God's praises in that practice. And this displeased God. And that is what uh, caused him to uh, flood the earth simply because he wasn't included. That is not outside of God's MO for the Old Testament, by the way. Oh, no, that like kind of was a lot of what he did. Um, he wasn't being included, and he decided to kill people because that's what a rational person would do in, in those circumstances. Um, but I'm, I'm excited to see if anyone has some equally serious answers or even some comedic answers in the comments for next week. That one made me almost a little bit depressed, even though it's such a, <laughs> such a good answer. Um, but we have, I, I've got a little bit of, a rant this week and I, I don't know um what richard thinks about all of this but something that i i've gone down a rabbit hole of catholicism especially recently and especially catholicism throughout history but also protestantism throughout history like both of these kind of branches of christianity have caused significant issues in the past um and looking back at a lot of the saints that particularly the Catholic Church, uh, like, respects and, and holds in high esteem, you look through the history of these people and the things that they've done, um, and if you're supposed to be elevating these people as, like, role models to society and people that are furthering God's will, it kind of brings into question um, what, what does the Catholic Church see as good, but also... Um, are these outdated ideas from, let's say, the, the Crusades and from the Middle Ages, from the the witch trials, all this stuff? Like, were those are those the same goals that they're having today? Because they're keeping they're keeping their same roster of saints. Like, I, as far as I know, the Catholic Church doesn't de saint somebody, um, and I've seen even posts on the internet from Catholics. Uh, who've read about certain saints, and they'll they'll make up excuses for why a certain saint still deserves to be a saint. Uh, the one in particular, um, well, there there are two in particular who were uh, members of the Spanish Inquisition. Who, like, their story resulted in in the deaths of of thousands of people. And this particular Catholic was saying, "Oh well." but you can't directly trace the the killings back to this one person. Therefore, it's not his fault, and he should still be a saint and stuff. 
But I mean, you think about how that sounds like this person didn't necessarily conduct the killings himself, but he was part of the system that did them. And he, he was the one who um, ordered the torture of, of these people. So he didn't necessarily hold the weapons himself, but he was a direct contributor. And how can we, or how can specifically a, a church organization that claims to have uh, humanity's like progress and, and humanity's well-being in mind, how can that organization say, this is a good person, you should look up to this person? What are your thoughts on this? Um, well, th this is a... This is this is always the case with the Catholic Church, isn't it? Or, or in fact, any churches uh, that they kind of make excuses for people. The Catholic Church is still doing it. Uh, you know, when it comes to the uh, to the child abusers, uh, that the priests who are committing these are, are horrendous, horrendous acts, they're just shipping them off to different territories and letting them continue to priest uh, in in places with children. And uh, you know it's it's not changed. I don't I don't think they're going to desaint these people because I genuinely don't think that they see it as a problem. The only problem is it coming to light publicly and the Catholic Church being uh, kind of in the limelight for it. That's the only problem for the Catholic Church. But when you've got a god, no, we've just touched upon this. When you've got a god who is quite happy to go out and slaughter people and take virgin girls as spoils of war simply for someone worshipping a god other than him. This is the kind of attitude you're going to get from that. And you can scream, it's the Old Testament, as much as you like. Mm -hmm. You can shout it from the rooftops, as many Christians do, but actions speak louder than words, and the church is still doing this. And, uh, you know, and it's not just throughout history. It's not just the Catholics, the Protestants have done the same. You know, the, the Anabaptists were chased down and slaughtered in the thousands by other Protestants simply for having a different theological viewpoint. You know, it seems that it's quite reasonable if you are a Christian to go out and uh, you know, to kill people. And you can justify it simply by saying, well, I believe that's what God wanted. It's horrendous. It really, really is. And as much as modern day Christians like to play the Old Testament card, it is still happening. It's still happening all over the world. And it might not be happening in your particular church. And good for you. You know, you know bravo for that. Your, your church not doing it. But there are other churches that are. And you are all Christians. You can't play the not a true Christian card. You are all Christians, and it's your job as a Christian who thinks these acts are violent, that they're shameful, that they shouldn't be committed to stand up against other Christians and, and kind of call them out for it. Stop shouting at us. I've just made a video about this. I've not published it yet, but I've just literally made a video on this subject. Stop having to go at atheists and calling atheists out for things when there's enough shit in your own backyard to clean up first. Once you've sorted your own problems out, then come for us. Sorry, that right, turned into more of a rant than I expected it was going to. Well, well, we we have this thing too, where we have different groups um, pointing the finger at each other and saying you're responsible for for more harm. Um, especially Christians pointing the finger at Muslims um, for violent acts, and you have Muslims pointing their finger at other groups uh, in similar ways. And you look to the history of any of these groups, and what we don't see a lot of is that their own groups owning up to their past and owning up to things that they did and fixing any of it. Like you can come forward and, and say, yeah, I, I don't support violence all you want. But when you look to a history that is full of it and you have people that were revered in the church who committed those acts and then you say, oh, well, they were fine. What does that say about your, your goals for the future? Are you actually intending to stop those acts or are you just not doing them because it's no, no longer socially acceptable and you won't get converts because of it? Like, I, I have a lot of questions about the intent behind a lot of these things that are being done. Um, and it, it all seems like, and we talk about this on the show a lot, the fact that the, the intent behind a lot of um, seemingly humanistic acts 
within religion seem to be done with this veil of of performance it's it's a lot of it's performative and would they be doing those things without that um and would they be doing worse things if they had if they felt like they were justified in in doing so like publicly um so i have a lot of questions and i would love even if we get some catholics or we get some some protestants or anybody else that wants to call in about this whether if you want to say that these people should remain saints or if you think um we should be handling these discussions in different ways call in let us know or if or if you've had an experience with um one of these organizations that has impacted you with this type of topic um let us know we'd love to hear about it yeah absolutely i had a conversation a, a couple of years ago uh with a, a christian uh whose name is and i'm sure he won't mind me saying his name uh, rich lockhart it was a public conversation. It was online. And uh, we had a great, great conversation. He's a gay man. He's a gay black man. He is a Christian. And we had the best conversation. So great big shout out to Rich because I know he's still out there. I'm friends with him on social media. And he is still speaking out when Christians do things wrong. So for all the Christians like Rich, you know, good on you. Carry on doing what you're doing because you, sir, are an example that I would like to see more Christians follow. Absolutely. Um, and before we get into some more ranting uh, <laughs> about, because we, I think, I think Richard and I could go for days talking about the Catholic Church um, and and about this whole topic. Um, but I do want to give some announcements, talking about different ways that you can support the channel. Um, so a couple ways that you can do that. Um, you can like the video below. You can share the video out to everybody um, that you know. Share it out to your religious family and friends. I would love to hear their thoughts as well, even if it's just in the, in the comment section or in the side chat. Um, you can... Uh, Go get some merch uh, from the store. We all love that. Tiny.cc slash merch ACA to grab some of that. Um, you can also print out some call-in flyers at tiny.cc slash ACA flyers, but make sure you're posting them with permission. Um, you can post them to community places, at universities, um, anywhere where it's acceptable to be posting um, advertisements. Just make sure you're not putting them at places that you know you don't have permission to post. We don't want to be those people that are just being annoying in places where we shouldn't be. So be responsible. Post them responsibly. Um, but if you do post a flyer, please get a picture of it and send it to tv at atheistcommunity.org and we'll feature it on an upcoming show um, with your posters. Um, there are also ways that you can get involved in the community, and you can go to www.atheist-community.org to learn about the organization, the policies, and how else you can get involved. We're always looking for volunteers, um, and we'd love to help you out with that. You can go to the website to figure out more about that. Um, what do you think, Richard? about listening to a voicemail go on then this is gonna be good I, I, I can feel it in my shoes look i'm a christian and i just came across our channel and i'm, I'm kind of a little upset that y'all believe being an atheist because god is love satan is hate now satan hates mankind hate represents Satan. church mark check, check the uh, youtube channel uh, or if you believe that that's evil that means you believe that evil has to come from somewhere such as Satan, such as homosexuality, such as all this other crap that's going on. I look around, I see evil. I see Satan and things that I see. I look around, I see love. I see represent representatives of God. God created this place, not evolution. There is God. People die and they come back. They say they saw something. Miracle. They happen all the time. Where do they come from? All blessings and miracles come from God. You know, I can go to Walmart like, well, he must spot a miracle. No, it comes from God. Y'all better check y'all, so, because I want you to know. I, I, I died, and God let me come back, and I saw something. And I, my life wasn't in order. And what I saw scared me. Now I'm a Christian. I've been dedicated my life. I, before I thought I had done this form, but apparently I didn't. Everybody's going to die. Everybody on this planet's going to die. We're all going to see God. I don't care if you believe in him or not. It doesn't matter what you believe. 
No, it does indeed. It does not matter what we believe. There's quite a bit to unpack in that. Wow. The wow. first thing I yeah. want to address in that, which is another thing I've recently made a video about, is uh, I feel like I'm <laughs> sorting myself off here. Uh, it just happens to be in all the right spots. Um, you, sir, did not come back from the dead. And if that is what informs your belief then you are believing on a false premise to begin with. Nobody, sir. And I'm sat here next to a medical doctor here, so I'm putting myself, frankly, on the line by saying this, but nobody has ever been recorded as coming back from the dead because what happens when NDEs occur or when someone is revived is you are revived and you have an experience in the process of dying. You do not die, legally die, and have these experiences and then get revived because that hasn't happened ever to anyone. You, there's too much, there's too much of this going on where people uh, have had so many of these conversations recently where people mistake uh, the, the process of dying for legal death. It is not the same thing. They are not the same. When you are in the process of dying and you have a near-death experience, your body is shutting down. It's in the process of dying. It has not died. I'm going to pass this on over to the uh, to the experts in the field and let him take you a little bit further into it. Yeah, it, it can be a pretty complicated process, but like, and it's funny too, because the, the definition of, of death has changed throughout history. Um, and as our knowledge has gotten better, we've kind of more solidified where the, where the line is between dead and not dead. And you even go back into history and you look at people's records of somebody that has supposedly died and then come back or um, had those near-death experiences. And in those days, they didn't have really good methods for determining death. And so you can have more of these recordings because what were they recording when they said somebody had died? Was it their heart had stopped? Um, was it they weren't moving, they weren't breathing? Like what metric were they using? Um, and for how long was that person under those circumstances? Like what was their temperature at that time? Were they uh, warm and dead or cold and dead? Because those are very different scenarios. Um, like what was everything that that led to this? Did they act, were they accurately able to assess neurological status? And that's something that they probably weren't able to do very well. Uh, and so, now that we've been able to draw these lines more clearly, we can look back and say, okay, how much of this recorded um, instance was death or was this something leading up to death? And, and there are a lot of questions there, but it just it opens more doors of, of differentials for what has happened, and it makes it even harder to um, define it as somebody who died and then came back. Uh, and, and I'm sure there's a lot of records we're missing of examples of this, which could maybe give us some more clues, um, about what people were thinking at the time, but it, it's, this whole voicemail was very interesting to me in a lot of different ways. And number one, this person was, it, it was a bit hard to understand, um, some of it, um, as it was very fast, but the something that came up and, and something that I actually was having a discussion with uh, on the internet. And I was really hoping this person is going to call in and maybe they will. Um, but I had a discussion with uh, a Mormon on Twitter and who made very similar statements about how, um, you know, good things come from God and then bad things come from Satan. And in this particular voicemail, you hear this person talking about, well, we if evil exists, then it has to come from somewhere. Where does it come from? It has to be Satan because that's where evil comes from. And, and you're having the assumption uh, that evil comes from Satan and there's really no other justification for why that connection was made. Um, and you often take people on these, uh, on these journeys through these topics and ask them questions that, um, 
trying to pin down, do they like have any reason to make that connection? Or is it maybe God that made evil and Satan's a byproduct of this? How did the whole story come together? And I think if you ask people to put this in a stepwise process, like we we all think of the story as very nebulous. And like we have the the different components of the story of of good and evil and how that all happened. But then you put it into a timeline or you put it into components of like, which is a component of what? And it's very messy. And I think it makes it very easy for people to keep moving the goalpost in that and saying, well, this is evil, but no, this one's also evil. And no, well, this, this evil comes from Satan, but then Satan was created by God as Lucifer, but then there was the free will component. And like, so how many components are in here and how many of them don't result in, in like God being the, the origin for them? Um, because you'll take them on this little rabbit trail of so this goes back to god right and they'll say yes like they'll say god is the the creator of everything um and then they'll mention something else like evil that was somehow not created by god or satan created the stuff and it was not created by god but also was and so it's just like this voicemail it's all very confusing and i just kind of want somebody to put it into a structure that is coherent and understandable um i would like some of these mess. arguments to be put into structures so we can hear and understandable because there are, there are quite a lot of them someone's asked in the chat actually uh i'm not going to read his name out because it could be seen as quite political but they've said to uh, buddhists see buddha there's actually a book by a, a guy called uh i think his name's sogyal rinpoche uh, Rinpoche is a title in Tibetan Buddhism uh, called the Tibetan Book of Living and Dying. And that goes into like afterlife, uh, near-death experience accounts from the Buddhist perspective. Uh, so if you're interested in that, that might be worth having a look at. Uh, so yeah, people do have culturally appropriate near-death experiences. Uh, they, they tend to experience the same thing because what happens what tends to happen in a near-death experience or what can happen is uh, um, uh, I forgot the name of the chemical. The brain releases a certain chemical which can be hallucinogenic in nature. And uh, it, it kind of gives the same kind of impressions out these tunnels of light, things like that, that everybody seems to experience. And then everybody puts their own cultural spin on it. So where, whereas the core might be the same, they then have their own cultural spin on it. And funnily enough, uh, some kind of uh, proponents of panpsychism uh, use this as evidence that uh, there is a universal consciousness because what they say, and they've literally read papers, legitimate scientific papers, which is scary that say this, that say we take the common elements of their experiences and dismiss the cultural ones. Now that's really bad science. That is bad science, everyone, because you're dismissing a certain part of your research to come to a conclusion with, that you want to come to, and that is not good science at all. And again, I'm going to pass it on over to the experts to talk a little bit on that. <laughs> well, yeah, that's very interesting. And and we, we do know that there are cultural components um, to this particular process. And that's something that we need to look into for, I mean, all areas of, of medicine as well, this huge cultural component. Um, and it's, I get the desire to want to keep science as completely objective and completely secular um, because we know that the culture is influenced by religion. It's influenced by societal gender roles and societal um, like hierarchies and, and all of these things that contribute to a, a culture. Um, and all of them can be very important. And this is where we end up blurring lines between like, is, is this physiological thing related to um, like, is it actually physiological or is this something socially related that then we try to give a physiological explanation to. And, and we find this 
um, as we're talking about neuroscience here, like this is how we get a lot of um, misinformation with regarding things like cultural influences on the brain. It's how we get things like gender influences on the brain, or it's like um, people thinking that logic is is for men um, and women can't do it because there's obviously a brain difference, but a lot of that is cultural and a lot of it's because we have societies that prioritize teaching of certain subjects to certain people in that society. And so you're going to see like more commonly different results because you're giving more resources to one group and not to another. Um, and then taking things like the near death experiences or, or taking um, hallucinations or any, any type of uh, experience that can change your belief system and number one, you have people priming and telling you this is what you're going to expect when this happens. And so you already have an image in your head. Um, and and it, when you have similar images in your head that all stem from a very similar tradition or similar book, um, you can expect that your, your brain has an image of that. Um, we're less likely to experience things that we can't comprehend an image of. Um, and I think we do need some more study on that. And I, I know that sociology and psychology are, are newer fields and, and that might be why people are hesitant to, to let them have kind of more of a space in this. And I expect that we're gonna see some more data uh, coming in, in this particular area, but Absolutely. I would agree. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm very interested to, to, just to kind of take us off topic a second that we have hmm. hundreds of people watching this show at the minute and I cannot believe that none of them are theists who disagree with us. I, I think I was possibly right at the top of the show when mm. I said that theists don't have the confidence because they know that they don't have the evidence that, to call in. Uh, you know, here's me and Ben sat here waiting for theists to call and give us the groundbreaking evidence. We have 90,000 plus subscribers that you could convince with one fell swoop that God exists. And you're not doing it. Why? Why aren't you calling in to produce, give us the evidence? Why aren't you calling in to give us a good philosophical argument? I put to you, theists, that it's because you know you can't. That's, that's my reasoning behind it all together. But look, it's not just me and Ben who do this. We have a crew. So I want to go to Crew Cam and have a look at our beautiful, beautiful crew who help us put this show together. Let's have a look at their wonderful, look at those wonderful people. Hi, crew. Look at them all. Uh, everyone except Greg, absolute stunners. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, uh, and of course, it's not just the crew will <laughs> make this show happen. It's everyone. It's all the volunteers, all the time stampers. Uh, show note writers, everybody. There's people. There's people with jobs that I don't even know what the jobs are. Those jobs are in the ACA, and they all make this organization work. And uh, you know, they all should. We, you all put our names in the chat with the little hashtags in front. <laughs> uh, you know, give some love to the crew and give some love to the volunteers because they are all worth it as well. Uh, ben, do you want to, in in lieu of a call, do you want to go through some of these screenshots? Yes. And would you like yes. to pick one to kind of talk about? I do, yes. I also, I did want to mention that the, um, I think that the atheist version of a near-death experience is basically you, you think you're dying and you end up, instead of seeing angels and Jesus, uh, you see the crew cam. And it's just it's just our crew, the ACA crew. Uh, is will be your vision. So I, I wonder if anybody leaves from here today has a has a supernatural experience and sees the the lovely crew cam because that would be my favorite experience. Um, yeah, let's go through some of these screenshots. Uh, the first one I believe is for Richard. Um, so this okay. one, I'll let you I'll let you take this one because this is this is for you. Number one uh, is, uh, well, the entire Bible is a historical document. So, yes, there is a recurring theme like no other book. Everything affirms everything in the Bible. And this was when I was uh, reacting to a claim 
which said the gospel accounts are historical sources, therefore true in my cold open. Um, you know, that's not the case. Something being a historical source doesn't necessarily make it true. In fact, when historians are siphoning through historical sources, they have to decide what is true and what is not. You, historians don't just read things and then suddenly come to the conclusion, oh, well, that was written a long time ago, therefore it's true. That just doesn't happen. That would be, that would, if that did happen, I would be a terrible historian who I, I not only wouldn't listen to, I'd also probably give them a good poke in the eye for being so silly. It's, uh, it's nonsense. That's not what historians do. They weigh things up on evidence. And, uh, you know, just because the gospel accounts are historic sources, and they are legitimate historic sources, that doesn't mean that everything contained in them is true. And if you think it does, you are also by proxy, saying that the Quran is true and the entirety of the Buddhist Tipitaka, which is 11 times longer than the Bible, is also true because and the yardstick every... you are applying, the methodology yeah. you are applying, also allows for those things to be true, Dr. Ben. Yeah, and I, I love to see them uh, say on the same line that every piece of... Um, egyptian mythology that has been recorded is also true like because if you're following the same like the same metric you get a lot of interesting mythology that now is also true um so i mean that's just this proven little point i know that we look to certain societies and say yeah this is some weird weird lore some weird mythology um and I think people don't don't quite consider that, yeah, if, if this thing is true, then based on this metric, all these other things are also true, including some of those more uh, historical religions that we know have um, some interesting components that, that we know aren't necessarily true. Like we know that the, the sun doesn't rise on a boat. We know that, uh, like, or even a chariot for that matter, like these aren't things that, that actually happen, but those would also be in the, the realm of reality. Yeah, absolutely. I was watching the live stream then and your lips were still moving. <laughs> it was looking. confusing. Yeah, um, yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's, let's do another one. Let's do one for you, Ben. Let's do number two. Uh, do you want to read this one out? Yes, okay. Because we have verifiable evidence for, from the entirety of human history that when men and women fill their gender roles, societies prosper, and we're literally living through the opposite as we speak. The, the, the grammar here is difficult. The nuclear family was decimated, and gender roles have been tossed out the window, and a couple of decades later, the West is a global laughing stock. Well, the West has been a global laughing stock not because of these reasons. Um, we're laughing. We're laughing stock for other reasons, but it's very interesting how um, the decline of the nuclear family is what is making the West a laughing stock, um, and the decline of gender roles. Yet we see very uh, different gender roles and and violations, if you will, of the natural gender roles in plenty of Eastern societies uh, as well that have have gone back through uh, millennia. Um, so looking back at what makes a woman and what makes a man, these are all very different things depending on culture. Um, and it's very funny when people take these very arbitrary lines and say, therefore, this is the natural order of things. Like what was in your head to, to make you say that? Like, how did you get this connection? Like you're making the connection, but I failed to see how you've established that this is the rule in the first place and not just something you're, you're throwing out there. Like it's an assumption um, that we're pretty frequently debunking and people just want to keep it as something that you can assume about people. And, and I mean, my own hypothesis about this uh, is that, I mean, one of them, there's many different hypotheses, but under that model, there's a certain type of person that by default innately gets to be at the top of the hierarchy and they don't have to do any work for it. Like they're just there. And when we have people uh, from different places in this hierarchy saying, hey, this hierarchy is made up, we don't need to follow this anymore. 
um, and they actively work for things and they start getting those positions that those people feel like they should innately have. Um, it's disrupting to our to our system as we know it, but it also means that people in places of privilege are going to have to work for things um, that they didn't previously have to work for. And I mean, that's just one component. There's many different components to this, but it's, it's easy to see why people are, are threatened by uh, changes in social mobility. But this isn't unique to the West. This is something that society has been, it's been going through uh, all across the globe and all throughout history. And, and I dare anybody that thinks that like progressive society is worse to go back and look through history and see what happened in historical eras, because it was not, it was not pleasant for the most part. Um, it was pretty horrifying. And if you want to go back to that, if you think that's better than what we have now, I challenge you to ask yourself why you think that, because that's pretty messed up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm with you on all points, uh, you know, from the fact that throughout history, gender roles have uh, been uh, interchangeable in some ways in, in like ancient Roman and Greek societies. Uh, we see it in uh, like uh, small cultures as well uh, that haven't had much uh, influence from the West. Uh, and it's it's all over the place. Uh, it's not a new phenomenon. I don't know why people think it is. And this idea the you know society is suddenly going to the dogs when we, we, some of the just go and read a bit of history from any any era any era at all there's a great set of children's books called horrible histories uh, and they if, if they are very for adults and children they're very very funny they're done in a very comedic way but they're all based on actual historic facts and go and read some of those. If you're not a hardcore reader and or they've got a TV show as well, go and find some of that on YouTube and watch those. Because the, if you're not into like this hardcore reading about histor history, 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 historicalness, uh, go and go and watch some horrible histories because they will definitely inform you of some of the weird, weird, unsavory practices that have been, uh, uh, you know, at the fore in the past that we don't really want to do anymore please not at all uh we have got a couple of super chats which i want to read out as well would you uh, like you to, to do... would you like to take some of them you 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 go ben all right i will read this first one uh this is from skepti skepti spike uh who looks like is a new member um gives 669 uh, it says that they had an awesome time visiting in person last week. I was humbly reminded as to how much public speaking is something to be practiced regularly. Yes, uh, definitely recommend practicing public speaking. Um, it is a great skill to have. But also, I'm glad that you were able to um, go meet people in person. I wish I could be down there more often. Uh, it sounds like a great time. I know the, the couple times I was there, it was really fun. Um, hoping to get back down there in the near future. But I'm glad you had a great time. Yeah, uh, Miranda Rensberger, our old friend, uh, member for two months, says it's only two months. I'm sure Miranda's been a member for more than that, but maybe my mind's going doolally. Maybe I'm releasing too much DMT. Uh, uh, $5 and says the Vatican's latest statement on trans people shows they will never improve their views. They talk about human rights, but oppose them every time. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's it's pretty sad. The the Catholic Church recently had like the, at one point we're like, oh, we're so progressive, we're gonna do all these things, and then now once again they've doubled back and they're like, no, actually no, that was a lie. We're not doing that. Um, good old Catholic Church. Uh, and then we have a super chat from Puck, five dollars, saying, I really did just pay five bucks to hear Richard say Puck and to hear Ben say Thysis. Um, so Richard, you have to. Well, seeing, seeing as you've paid Puck, I think we've got to say Puck, Puck. I think it's only fair, Puck, that I say Puck, Puck, seeing as you've paid $5 for me to say Puck, Puck. Thank you for the super chat, Puck. Amazing. Uh, and with that, we're going to take some calls. Let's go with James He Him from No Location Given. I'm guessing somewhere on Earth. Uh, James, 
you are on Talk Heathen. Uh, it sounds like you want to talk about how to respond to miracle claims. What is your, your specific question on this? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh, hello. So my question is about uh, how to uh, respond to miracle claims where uh, someone claims that a miracle has happened, for example, uh, a, a claim where uh, a, d a dead person was uh, risen to life and then the dead person showed that showed who, who their killer was and then then that was like the miracle and they became like dead again and and then when someone like has made that claim then then if I say I cannot like uh, distinguish that from uh, I can distinguish that, that from uh, a clever trick of, uh, or for for a clever magic trick, and and then the, then then they start to say that oh you have to now perform the uh, magic trick yourself to show that that can happen and it it could have happened two thousand years ago for example. So do do I have the burden of proof there to show the magic trick? No, no, I don't think so. You, you don't need to be able to replicate a thing to show that it was not real. Um, like that, that burden's not on you. And especially like, I'm trying to understand kind of the context of this. It sounds like you had a conversation with somebody who used an example of somebody um, that may have been a, a historical event where somebody had died, uh, like they had been murdered and then came back to life and then pointed out who the murderer was. Is that, does that sound correct to you? Yeah, I have our other examples too, about similar, but that's one of them. Yeah, and there are plenty of natural explanations for a story like that. And of course, I don't know all of the details, but one of the, probably one of the best ways that you can engage with this particular discussion is asking that person for for more details. Um, oftentimes, when people tell a story or when people make connections, they skip around between things that are associated, which is a really good skill to have um, in a lot of creative storytelling uh, and more artistic endeavors. However, it skips over a lot of steps. So a lot of times people might be starting at A, and then they skip over to C, and then they skip over to E and F, and then it's kind of hard to follow. And, and we we ourselves also follow in that same way, where we don't we don't notice that we're missing pieces. We don't know that B is missing. We don't know that C is missing. Um, and so you can kind of slow them down in the story and say, okay, so here's the context you're giving me. Here's where we started, and then kind of what mm -hmm. what happen next like what happened in, next in the sequence and that's kind of one way to get some more information just asking more questions to figure out exactly what were the contributing factors to this like i can see in in this particular example if somebody um is attacked uh and is dead or nearly dead as my first thought there is did they actually die um because that's that's important uh and how like what was the method of death how like long did it take them to go unconscious because you, it doesn't take very long to get memories in your head um it doesn't take more than a split second to see the person in front of you so if this was a case and i'm just speculating as well but if somebody were to be stabbed and have a a, a slower dying process uh to where they don't really completely die, but they're maybe in hemorrhagic shock or something, they can get resuscitated and then point out who the killer was or, or describe them because they had enough time for that memory to take hold. And so you don't necessarily need to prove that that's what happened, but what you're doing is you're expanding the differential. So where one person had said, this is the reason this happened or like this is the outcome of the story like i am committed to uh this being the cause how did they arrive that that is the one cause or one possible cause like you can expand out 
and say, this is something else that could have possibly happened. How did we rule out this possibility? Or how do we rule out this other one? And in a case where you have a supernatural claim versus a natural claim or multiple natural claims, uh, or even just possibilities of a natural claim, then you're, you're still left to say, I don't know. We're not going to have an answer to was this a real event or did this actually happen in the way that they're saying it did. We're not going to be able to make a claim because that would give us the burden of proof. Um, so we don't want to do that. But we can say, I don't know, but here are some more possibilities that we could investigate. And then comes the, the decision of how, how much do we want to investigate this claim? Do we have the necessary means to do so? And that could go into a whole like field of history. Like I'm sure somebody could look at that specific event you're talking about and do a PhD project on it. Like there's so much depth there. Um, but it's all of that being said, it is not your burden to replicate it or to even prove that one of these hypotheses was in fact correct. But you have to you kind of have to, to frame it as I don't know, but here's some options. Um, Richard, kind of what are your thoughts? Yeah, I think, look, the the Catholic Church, uh, and I think most uh, religious religions and religious organizations would probably agree with this definition, uh, defines a miracle as a sign or wonder, such as a healing or control of nature, which can only be attributed to a divine power. That only is very important in there. And I think that's very problematic. So if we take the Bible as a, as a kind of case study of this, we can split miracle claims in the Bible into different categories. It's certainly what I do. Uh, the first category is those which are rep replicable by other means. And these include things like Jesus walking on water, changing water into wine, healing the sick or talking donkeys. Any competent magician could replicate these things and make people believe that he had the power for those things to happen. Uh, so that one falls outside of the Catholic Church's definition anyway, which can only be div uh, attributed to a divine power. So there's already, we've already dismissed lots and lots of miracle claims from the Bible with just that. The second category is those which are exceptionally unlikely so, for example, Abraham and Sarah conceiving Isaac in old age. Uh, Abraham was around 100, Sarah was around 90. Or Daniel not being killed in the lion's den. These, can, uh, these are unlikely events. Now, there's a, a statistic law called Little Woods Law, which uh, defines unlikely or impossible events as miracles, uh, math, he calls them mathematical miracles. They're not miracles in the real sense. They're just really, really, un, uh, in the supernatural sense, they're just really unlikely. And he worked out, uh, Littlewood, that he was an English mathematician. It worked out that they happen statistically at a rate of one in a million and at a frequency of about once a month per individual. Littlewood's law is a, a subset of the law of very large numbers. So in, impossible or exceptionally unlikely events happen. And statistically, they happen a lot. They really, really do. That discounts a whole, an other whole huge swathe of biblical miracle claims. And the third category is those which appear to contradict the laws of nature or the laws of logic, such as the big one in Christianity, people coming back from the dead. And as we've already discussed uh, at some length on today's show, that's never happened. Nobody has ever come back from the dead or been demonstrated to come back from the dead and it, it being confirmed. So these, you know, we've, we've got an example there of every category of miracle claim that the Bible professors can either be explained by something else or has never been demonstrated to happen. This takes your burden of proof right out of the window. You don't have to prove that a magician can make it appear that water's turned into wine. That's not your job to do. It's the person making the claim that only God's divine power can turn water into wine. 
can and that this cannot be replicated by other means and we can show that to be false really really easily by showing that magicians can in fact replicate this trick and make it appear that water has turned into wine we've got no verification that water actually was actually turned into wine by jesus We've got accounts that water was turned into wine. That's no different from me going to a parlor magician and him appearing to turn water into wine and me returning home to my good lady wife and children and saying to those people, it's magician was really good. He turned water into wine. I have, there's, there's nothing to suggest that's not, that's not what happened in the Bible. And if somebody claims that this is only from a divine power, they have to show the 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 event recounted in the bible was in fact from a divine power and not just a recorded parlor trick and they cannot do that they simply cannot do it so we there's a lot a lot of problems with your friend's claim uh we've been talking for quite a long time james would you like to respond to us I, I think you answered it uh, very well, uh, because because my, my point was there there that 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 they, they made the claim that uh, someone had had risen uh, from dead and and I, I had responded that I I cannot really distinguish it from a magic trick or but I, I'm not a magician but I have seen very convincing ones uh, and that that was a lot like my point and then they said that. That uh, I have to make the trick myself to show that uh, that 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 was the way way it was done. Yeah, yeah, that that's a that that's not only uh, unfair of them to put that burden of proof on you. It's also a little bit dishonest because unless they're coming from a position where they know somebody has returned from the dead, which they don't. They, they can't really do that. They've got to demonstrate that the person actually re returned from death. And the only way you can verify that is by looking through the medical literature. And if you look through the medical journals, which I have, because I am an incredibly boring tit, I have not <laughs> found one example of anybody returning from death. Now, that's not to say there isn't any, but I've not found one, and all the medical uh, literature I have read states that this cannot happen. Once you are uh, legally dead, you cannot return from that state. And in the cases, and this is a very important point to make, and you will find this if you do a quick Google, in the cases where people have been reported to return from legal death, in every single instance, Further investigation has found the clinician to have made a mistake and that and misreported that death to begin with. Mm, interesting. So uh, yeah. is there anything else, James, you'd like to ask us? Uh, maybe I, I can expand a little bit that. Uh, yeah, go for it. it, it um, like let's like I haven't met met any uh, like magician who has made this or something, but let's say there is uh, someone who can tell that, uh, or who lived like three thousand years ago and they made made the hypothetically and they made like the claim claim that this in these days, like let's say January third midnight, this this king in this area will die from meteor meteor drop, and then they made the claim again and again, and it seems to come uh, true. Uh, would that that be counted as uh, like from divine origin? No, this is this is something that you'd have to look into the specifics of the claim. No biblical claim that I have come across meets a, a burden of being. Uh, reasonably specific, uh, specific enough to count as a, a good prophecy uh, of something coming true. No biblical uh, prophecy says on this date, at this time, this exact thing will happen to this exact person 
and we we have that recorded ideally we'd like to have it recorded in some form that wasn't retrieved and could be verified to be ancient but wasn't retrieved until after the event because you've also got the problem and we see this uh, in global politics shall we say without getting specific where we can see people working to make a uh, biblical claim biblical prophecy come true people are actively uh -huh. working towards that end and that discounts that from being a prophecy because all that is is somebody reading something and being inspired by it to do it that doesn't make it a prophecy a prophecy has to be clear and distinct and precise and be uh shown to have happened without any kind of uh, influence from people trying to make it happen in order to fulfill the prophecy. Right. And, and even in that regard, like um, even without people knowingly like doing things to try to further along the prophecy, you can also think about certain factors that could be like predictive factors themselves. Um, like it's not hard for humans to, establish like patterns and to recognize when things are heading in a certain direction especially if they're repeats of events that have happened before or very similar like if you look at um historical figures or um historical events you can pretty clearly like uh, for certain things say leading up to a revolution or leading up to a war or leading up to a change in leadership you can see certain things um predisposing the the society to those those factors like um signs of like civil unrest signs of like poverty levels signs of like health crises certain things that could all lead to certain events and if you know that a particular figure um has a certain level of power or authority in that particular area then you could say reasonably looking ahead these factors could cause some unrest and this person could be a target of this unrest. Same thing with like, if you know that certain countries are going to be um, more likely to go to war against each other, it's not hard to predict ahead of time, which ones are going to be more likely to have conflict and which ones aren't like, yeah, you can have variations on how accurate you are about that. Um, and specific people that would be um, leading at that time, et cetera. Like, but a lot of times, especially biblically looking at more like situational things, um, they're very vague. Like they'd say like this particular, they won't even say like a particular name of a leader, but like a certain leader is going to rise up, this country is going to uh, flourish. And then at some point, however many years after that, it's going to fall. Like I could look at a society and probably if I looked through the record, if I looked through the events that had happened, we could even probably find patterns that led up to that event. And so it, we have to be careful as well to think of like, are we seeing a pattern that formed and now we're uh, someone's making a prediction based on that, or are they making a specific like supernatural prediction? And those can be all different um, as well. But regardless like we have many different things that we could believe to be like the reason why people would recognize a prophecy or why they'd see these events happen at certain times um and so like richard said i i think that there's there's a higher level of evidence that would need to present for us to say that this was a, a supernatural prophecy as opposed to somebody who was very good at um predicting trends or people had had planned for certain events to happen um to match a certain prophecy mm, yes yes uh, i see and uh, i think there's also the oral tradition to account which is not like in written form and would not necessarily lead any uh written evidence and behind but but still to like hold some knowledge in uh, an ancient civilization or so. Yeah, yeah it's, it's a very interesting subject. Uh, thank you for calling, James. Uh, we're going to let you go. We appreciate your call. It's, it was an interesting subject to talk about. Uh,
please do call again if you if you hear anything back from your friend. Uh, give us a call back and keep us updated because uh, I'd be interested to see, uh, you know, get your mate to watch the show and uh, uh, get them to, uh, you know, comment on it. And in fact, get them to give us a call themselves if they disagree yeah. with us. Uh, we're going to do the top five. I suppose top I've got to read them out, haven't I? Because I'm technically yeah. the guest host. So it's... Uh, so number one, we have Dingleberry Jackson. Number two, oops, all singularity. Number three, Devo of Valjean. Number four, is that number four? I've, I've got lost on the numbers. Kalevi, 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 And the number five, <laughs> left in the leaves and an honest, honorable mention to number six, Kese, Kikin, 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 Dal, Dal, Dal. I have no idea. I'm sorry, Kesa. Please forgive me. Uh, it's, it's the punishment I receive for having to put up with Ben constantly. Yes. Sorry. <laughs> yes, and if you want to come up with a cool name uh, to be read on the air, you can go to Patreon and become one of the top five patrons of the week. So you can do that at tiny.cc slash Patreon TH. And... If you're one of the top five or the top six for the uh, honorable mention, we will have to read your name on the stream and we'll give you a shout out. That list does change uh, every week. We update it. So there are a lot of the similar names that we see, but the competition is open. So uh, if you'd like to be one of those names, that is how you can do it. And we've got quite a few calls on the line right now. Um, I'm going to ask Richard, do you, would you... We got a few good ones here. Um, would you like to take number eight or number 11? Uh, let's go with 11, I think. 11. I think All uh, right. We're going to take number 11. Um, Jeff, he, him from Kentucky. Sounds like you want to talk about slavery and morality. What is your perspective? Yes. Just, I guess, in the grand scheme of things, the Bible, as it is today, it just it proves God's morality. And even if we look at things that I know atheists like to use, like um, slavery, that proves God's morality. How? Because, especially like just in the historical context, right? Slavery was just a common practice in the ancient world. And the Bible, when it addresses slavery, it does so within the context of that society when it was just part of everyday life. So how does that prove so, that it's moral? I'm sorry? How does that prove that it's moral? Because in the ancient world, right, everyone was doing it. So it's like, I guess in that grand scheme of things, it was okay for everyone because even – the other religious people at the time were still practicing slavery. And so let me ask you this question. I don't know if I want, I want to make sure you understand what you're communicating to us by saying this. So if there's something that was being done by everybody at that time frame and that society, and they said it was okay, the fact that it was in the Bible and in the book, that means that that thing was okay. Is that the argument you're making? Yeah. So if there's so anything that was acceptable for society at that time that is also mentioned in the Bible is moral and okay. Yeah, it's moral and okay. And even, I mean, throughout the Bible, there's parts where, if like in the Exodus story, where God shows concern so is, for the and downtrodden. So is abortion okay? Abortion, abortion yeah. is technically in the Bible, so yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, um, Richard, do you have uh, other examples of, of things uh, that are I, okay? I want to, I want to first <laughs> ask a question, Jeff. Uh, are you, are you huh. claiming, because I think this is a very important question to ask, are you claiming that objective morality exists? What I'm claiming is that all morality comes from the Bible. Are you claiming that it's objective? 
or not. It doesn't matter. We, we you know, just answer honestly, whichever yeah. answer it is. In in regard to the biblical text, yeah, it is objective. Right. What do, so? What do you mean in in regards to the biblical text? Because let's for, say, for example, if it's objectively moral, in if it's moral in the biblical text, but then you make the claim that the same act is immoral outside of the biblical text, then it is not objective. That is literally the opposite of what objective means. Yeah. So I'm trying to gather gather whether you uh, gather whether you're saying the object uh, morality is objective or whether it is subjective. It's objective. Right. So can you give me an example, either in God's uh, through God's actions and instructions in the Bible where it demonstrates objective morality? Um, so again, like the teachings in the New Testament, right? Or even in the New Testament, we can just go old school with the Old Testament, right? The Ten Commandments, right? We don't kill, right? And it's become law because it's objectively evil to kill people. And, except, except, right? hold on, though. Except we do. And in fact, the Bible condones killing people. And God commanded people to be killed. So there's that's a contradiction then in your specific morality then is it is it okay to kill or is it not okay to kill and and I guess a important thing there is specifically the Ten Commandments says to to not murder but there's still some questions there there's a lot of murders even that you could say were committed um, in in the name of the Bible uh, like even during the Bible like I would say that the majority of the killings. Uh, in the Bible were not justified, and I would classify those as murder. Um, so is it is it okay to kill people, or is it not okay to kill people? I'm a little bit confused then about what the standard is. Yeah. Well, so murder is not okay when it is, I guess, what I'm trying to say is murder is used as a punishment to crime. So when it's used in the old testament right and when jo when um joshua is going around doing what he needs to do to secure the promised land right he's punishing he's acting on god's behalf and punishing these evil people who are committing you know sodomy and gay sex and they're worshiping idols and whatnot so so it's not objective then evil so it's not objective it's objective in the sense that you can't murder anyone in the community. No, that's not objective. That does that's not what objective means. Okay, but but then and also your 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 inter, your definitions are, are becoming funny here. So if so you so you can you can kill somebody if it's you know to punish them for for sins. Um but it's you can't do that to anybody in your community. So then if you're someone in your community commits one of these sins, like if there's a gay person in your community, is it okay to kill them or not? Well, if it's a punishment that has been dictated by God in the Bible, it should be okay. That's scary. Murder is That's really, really scary. scary. That's really scary. So do you think that that should be the metric for how we can, like, how we perform justice today? Are you saying that that is that's something that is moral? We should do it. Yeah, because we we should do it is we should be practicing God's law and carrying out. The Let me just list a few things off to you, Jeff. Uh, we've got murdering of gay people. We have taking virgin girls as spoils of war. We have, uh, let's have a think of some other <laughs> wonderful, oh, slavery, slavery is in there, isn't it? Slavery. And you are suggesting that these are all morally good acts because they are contained in the Bible and commanded by God. I want to remain con consistent and say, yeah. You're Thanks, consistently sir. horrible for saying that. Like, I, and I, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that we shouldn't be killing anybody. 
for any reason ever. Like that's my position. Um, and if this is the morality of your God, and if this is if if anything in the in the Bible is fair game, including the things you just mentioned, that is absolutely terrifying. I want to ask you, like, does does God care about humanity? Like, do you believe that God is is loving towards people? Well, I think in terms of loving, right, we're supposed to love, you know, the people in our community as long as, you know, they don't break the law. They don't break the rules. So you're supposed to love people as long as they don't do things you don't like. Is that the message that Jesus said in the New Testament? Is that the New Testament message? Is Hold on. Like, do you believe that the New Testament is is the same Bible that you follow? I believe in the original word of God. So honestly, I kind of look at the Old Testament because that's more in pristine context than the New Testament. New Testament, I know, has a lot of edits in it. It's been changed over time. And where there's differences, there's differences in in how the Old Testament and the New Testament think that they should carry out punishments and, and how you should treat people. And you're are are you saying that we should throw out the teachings of the New Testament as far as the law? Should we go back to the Old Testament? I think well, even Jesus says, you know, that he hasn't come in to get rid of the law. He is, you know, we still have to live by those laws. So even though Jesus was here, Jesus came and he died and he resurrected from the dead, right? We still have to obey the original law and command. He hasn't taken that away. So if they so if they don't follow those original laws, including, um, I don't know, have when's the last time you ate shrimp? Oh, I couldn't even tell you. When's the last time you wore something with mixed fabrics? Mixed fabrics? When's the last time you worked on a Saturday? Never. Just never? You're saying you've never? I I always try to keep my weekend, Saturday and Sunday, both clear of work. I Jeff, live my life. Jeff, Jeff, I'm Jeff, calling Jeff, bullshit. Jeff, 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 Jeff. I call Jeff, bullshit. Are you a troll? <laughs> are you phoning up to try and wind us up? I'm sorry? Are you trolling us? Are you phoning up to wind us up? Are, are these not your sincerely held beliefs? And are you, are you calling in to try and wind us up? No, they are. They are yeah, your sincerely I'm... held... Do you have children, Jeff? I do not. If you had children and one of them was gay, would you kill that child? Well, I can't kill them because it's not the law in this country. But even the Bible in Proverbs, it says, you know, a child should feel the feel the rod. Do you think they should be killed if you had a child and they are gay? Well, again, I can't kill them because it's not... I didn't ask you if you could kill them. I said, do you think that they should be killed? I think if there was no alternative to them, they were refusing to confess to their sin and change, then I think the unfortunate truth is they should feel the be subjugated to God's law, just like everyone else. All right, I'm hanging up. Jeff this is, chose yeah. to leave us today, yeah. unfortunately. We're hanging up. <laughs> we, we, me, and, me and Ben were both yep. on the same page We with do that. not support genocide. Um, we do not support murder. We do not support... And it's interesting that he comes in here and talks about how we shouldn't murder people um, and then openly advocates for it. And we don't support any of that here. Um, all of human life is is important, and we do not murder people. Christians, <laughs> Jeff said that he was being sincere. They were a sincere held belief. He, as far as I am concerned, is representing you. Do you want that person to represent you? If you do not, give us a call next week and tell us why you think Jeff is wrong. I said this at the very start of the show. Instead of having a go at atheists, clean your own house first. There is a perfect, perfect example. If Jeff was being sincere, which I'm not convinced of, but if Jeff was being sincere, I asked him outright and he said yes, then 
you need to clean your own house. You really, really do. We're going to clean. We're going to take another yeah. call. We're going to let's take. take. Let's yeah. Let's take Christian from Florida. Yeah. Wants oh. to talk about nihilism from a religious perspective. Christian, what is your argument? Oh, yeah. Um, can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Um, yeah, so um, I just – so um, I, I, I've, I'm a theist now. Uh, I'm a Christian now, and I, I want to apologize uh, because for uh, Jeff's behavior. That was absolutely uh, atrocious and a, a, an atrocious way to uh, represent the Bible. That's, it, that was awful. Um, but anyways, uh, nihilism uh, – so as a theist, um, there had been times in my life when I had kind of – contemplated like do i really believe uh, in a god or do i believe in more of a naturalistic worldview and i was trying to think through the implications of that and um i i just i have a hard time justifying any type of like intrinsic meaning or value or objectivity when it comes to morality um in a naturalistic worldview um and I, i'm not like trying to call anybody out who is uh, a naturalist, uh, like a, an, an atheist naturalist, but I'm just kind of curious, like how you guys work through that, how you kind of like just logically, you know, had, attribute meaning to life or, or find like true intrinsic right and wrong, good or evil um, with that worldview. Richard, do you want to start with this one? Um, repeat the question again, because there was quite <laughs> a lot there. Try and simplify it for me, please. Yeah. Um, so like, um, basing off of a naturalistic worldview, you know, that essentially, you, you know, the universe began, we don't really know how, but everything is a result of natural processes. That's why we're here. We're, we're no different than really any other animals. We're just more self-aware, uh, to the point where it's kind of like a curse. We just, you know, uh, we have to think about why we're here and the other animals don't. And so what I'm asking is like, what, what is the, the reasoning or the justification for uh, the concepts of morality in this worldview? Because it, to me, it would seem like everything is kind of just based off of what feels good to you, what doesn't feel good to you. Um, Cause there, there's no, nothing different or there's nothing quote unquote wrong uh, with murder. Uh, compared to like uh, death in the animal kingdom, one animal, uh, a different species killing other species. So I'm just like, right. you know, okay. So like right and wrong. Uh, there's there's a couple of things there, Christian, that I think uh, I might need to address. One is, and and I'm not a biologist by any stretch of the imagination, and I will always say that this is my weakest field. But as far as I'm, I know, we are not uh, the same. Uh, we're not just simply the same as other animals. Uh, you know, we are we are quite different to them, despite uh, biology words that I don't fully understand. <laughs> um, but that aside, um, I think I think that there's a, there's an issue here. There's two issues here. One is I I don't particularly like the term worldview, because I would suggest that we agree on more than 99% of things in reality that exist in reality. Uh, so worldview to me is a, it's a philosophical kind of position where you're starting with one presupposition against another presupposition, and it's not particularly useful to argue worldviews. Uh, but that aside, that that's a nitpick from me rather than anything else. I think, in direct answer to your question, uh, we do have things which do affect morality. And, you know, we, we suffer. We die. These are part of the natural world. Uh, death and suffering and pain and loss and feelings and emotions are all part of the natural world. And they are all go towards, uh, like, creating... Uh, you know, morality and moral, the way we deal with things morally. It's not just a case that we're coming from a completely pl uh, plain state, nothing happens, and 
you know, we just create these morals on a whim. That, I agree, would be silly. If we lived in this utopia where no one suffered, no one died, and we just went around saying, right, on this whim, I'm going to choose to do this or I'm going to choose that, uh, and it is entirely down to me and it's not going to affect any of society and there will be no reprisals for it. I'm just going to do it. That would be silly. I absolutely agree that that would be silly, but that's not how the world works. People die, people suffer, uh, you know, and these affect, we, we would say, I would say, I'm not going to say we because I don't speak for anybody else apart from myself. I would say that we have a uh, subjective morality based on objective facts. Mm -hmm. And those objective facts are things like suffering, things like death, and then the way we assess the world, which is a whole different uh, argument, uh, <laughs> that's, a, that's a fantastic field of study in itself, uh, but the way we assess this world is, is usually through emotion, uh, you know, and uh, I think there's a lot of reading you can do on that to kind of look at that from a naturalistic point of view from emotion and there's lots of great neuroscientists that uh, uh work do work on that uh dean Burdett is one uh he's, he's just wrote a book on emotions and uh there is a guy antonio di mazio who is uh he's really constructed a kind of idea of consciousness through emotion uh, and he, he is a fantastic neuroscientist. He is a hard read if you get any of his books. They are not simple. Uh, Dean Burnett is uh, fantastic because he writes in very layman terms and it's easy to understand. Antonio DiMazio is not like that at all. His books are a slog, let me tell you. But they are worth it if you can kind of read through it and understand them. Uh, you know, we we work through things through our emotions and through the way we assess the world and we don't we don't see the world as it is out there because out there the world is constructive of little blips and particles and like sparks that we can't really see so as a species we have this uh, this interpretation of the world which is entirely based around our senses and uh, 80 to 85 percent of our sensory input, the way that we assess the world, comes through our eyes, comes through the uh, the vision, and we, uh, you know, that's how we assess the world, and it goes into our brains. We do. It's not like video, we don't see the world like a video camera. It's not like a film where what we're doing is seeing what's there. It comes into our brains, and then we form a picture, and largely what we see is formed of memory. So when we're assessing the world, it's not a case that we just, we're just we just looking, information's coming in, and then we are processing that, and that's what there is. A lot of what we have is what's already been constructed, and then we take this information that's coming in, and we cross-reference that to what we all already have, and that's how our brains work. And all of these wonderful processes go in to how we actually form our moral uh, psyche and moral consciousness and things like that. but th And they are subjective to us, but they are based on objective facts like death. So we've got these whole, these lots of different things going on. We've got the way we're assessing things, our emotional connection to those things, and then these objective facts, which are all bouncing off each other. So that is how I would answer the question. How do we okay. kind of construct uh, morality from that? Ben, do you want to kind of jump in? Yeah, like that's a very, very good explanation. And I'm I'm in a camp as well where I, I think the way we decide whether or not something is moral is very subjective. Um, and, and I do think that, like Richard was saying, objective facts play into this. Like there are people that suffer. There are um things that are not ideal there's there's a lot of suffering there's a lot of death um there's really the the things we need to be alive unfortunately require other things to no longer be alive um like there isn't a way for a human uh, or or uh, many other animals to function without either killing a plant 
killing an animal, etc. Like at some point, something that was alive is not going to be alive after um, you you eat it. So it it sucks. Like there's a lot of things in this reality that I wish were not the case. And I think that morality has largely been a very dynamic process over time. And there there are things that like I think the ultimate goal is to reduce suffering um, and increase happiness, pleasure, whatever you want to to say that is. The question is what defines each of those things? And that's something that humanity has been struggling with for forever, trying to figure out um, what are these things? What do they mean? How do we achieve it? And looking back at certain points in history, I, we can say, yeah, this was a bad thing. So um, it's a reasonable question to say, where where do we get this uh, metric? And like, how do we define these things? And I think it's still a work in progress. It's always going to be getting to the place where, where we can achieve much more of uh, the reduction of suffering. Um, and looking back the past, we didn't really know how to do a lot of those things. Like we didn't know a lot about disease. We didn't know a lot about human rights. Like uh, the concept of the human being valuable and having intrinsic worth uh, is something that came about, you know, during the Renaissance. Um, and there's some discussion of it prior um, in in classical philosophy, but like that idea just wasn't super present, especially in like medieval Europe you see them acting a lot differently to each other because they didn't have a, a solidified belief that people were worth anything just being alive. Um, and we look back and we say, that's, that's horrible. You, you shouldn't treat people like that. And, and I, I can't say that that is something that, you know, is like the idea that that is worth something isn't necessarily something objective. And I don't think I would say that morality in itself is objective. Um, but in our subjective morality, we can work towards eliminating some of the more objective factors that lead to how we, how we view this. I know it's a lot of word salad and, and this is a very difficult discussion that, that has taken humanity, uh, a, a long time to to sift through, and I think we're going to get to more ideas in the future uh, as far as that. But I think it, it's kind of problematic, though, to look at something like morality that is so abstract and ambiguous and and very dynamic, and then use that as a way to like direct us into a, a theist or atheist camp. Um, and it's very interesting that that's often a factor that that does lead to our decisions. But at the end of the day, I I don't think that the thought of having like a naturalistic perspective or having certain views on morality. Um, I'm I'm curious why this is such a such a sticking point for you. Um. I, I guess it's just because um, I, I had just struggled to find, um, you know, any meaning in life outside of there being a creator and there being a greater purpose to life besides just this. Uh, it's just a kind of timeline that's running its course uh, and, you know, life happening on this planet is just kind of a just a coincidence and there doesn't seem to be any other significant signs of life out there. And it's just, it's, it was just very depressing for me, uh, not, not being able to find any true intrinsic value to life. Uh, and that's, and that's I, fair. I do you, do you think that like, I, I get it's a very scary thing and very depressing thing, but do you feel like you need an answer about whether or not, humanity has a purpose or humanity is special or that anything has a purpose. Do, do you need that? You think? I, I do think I need that. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's almost, it's almost unbearable for me to think otherwise. Like it's very unbearable. Yeah, that's, 
That's that's really interesting, Christian. I really appreciate your sincerity on on this subject. Uh, I really do, and it's difficult um, because you know, I, and it's weird as well, considering kind of the the subject you've called about. Because I, I I'm a father. I've got children, and I find a great deal of meaning through love for, for for life through my children through my wife through my friends through my interests and i think there's a great deal and god doesn't enter into it for me and i have these huge swathes of meaning that come into my life i've lost both my parents and all of my grandparents and i have a you know those objective facts instill my life with more meaning that I, you know, that death is an uh, is something that occurs to us, means that I want to value every moment of this life and love the people I love and spend a great deal of time and attention for the people I love. And, I, you know, I appreciate so much. I went up to Edinburgh uh, and met a few friends this weekend. Uh, it's, it's about a five-hour drive for me. I took my... Uh, youngest daughter up to Edinburgh and we had a great time met with friends had so much time so much fun had so much value given to us from those experiences and God was nowhere to be seen it was nowhere in that equation whatsoever so I find it really interesting that you've kind of called in with this question and at the same time as a believer you're saying that you're struggling for meaning. And that is something, I mean, that's not something I can relate to particularly, but it's something that I thank you for your sincerity for and your honesty for, for kind of putting forward. And, you know, th this is something that, and we don't give advice on the show, and I'm not going to give you advice. What I'm going to say is kind of have a listen back to the call and and really kind of digest what has been said on every level uh, by myself and Ben and, and kind of see how that fits into your religious belief. See whether you think God is necessary for morality within that sphere. Uh, I'm going to I'm going to let you respond to me, then I'm going to hand you over to Ben to kind of uh, take you out. Uh, okay, um, I'm sorry. So you wanted me to answer what now? I just want you to respond to what I've just said, and then I'll let Ben talk to you for a while. Um, just uh, wait. I'm, I'm sorry about uh, just God being necessary for morality, um, or, or or just just everything. I mean, I, I'm I'm definitely going to uh, be listening back and reflecting on this um, yeah. because you know th there are things in my life that 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 I have, give my life more purpose than it did before have, having a family now and having children. I, I do have things that, that those are things that I feel are, are worth continuing living for. Um, you know, whether that's just based off of, you know, evolutionary instinct, I, I don't know, but you know, in a place when I, when I didn't have those things and it was kind of just me and just my, my experiences, just, you know, not having uh, that purpose w w was a struggle for me. Um, but, but yeah, ha having, having experiences that bring you know, true love and joy, um, definitely, um, help keep on going. Um, and if I work to come into a place where, you know, I do not believe, you know, in a, a bigger picture, you know, in, in a God anymore, I, you know, I, I definitely still could keep going, but it's, it's a thought, a nagging thought that I've. I've always come back to, um, and, uh, you know, I, I can distract myself all day long. Um, but that thought persists in my mind always, uh, this, yeah. Yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to hand you over to Ben shortly. I'm, I just want to say, because you are going to listen to this back, uh, so you will be able to kind of write this down when you've got more time, please, uh, consider giving recovering from religion a call. Uh, they're not. Ju they don't just deal with uh, atheists and people who've come out of religion, but they do deal with people who are still religious, and they yeah, they have helplines and uh, counselors who can kind of help you through some of these struggles. 
so you know that's just a name for when you listen to back just to bear in mind and to look up for yourself uh dr ben is a medical professional i'm going to let him take you out i just want to say thank you very much for calling i do appreciate your call yeah and and i just want to say and i i i encourage you to call back again especially call back at the like near the beginning of a show so we can give you like a lot of, a lot more time to go through this topic because i think it's very important to, to discuss and i think that it's on the minds of, of really everybody i think everybody has struggled with this particular thing especially people who've uh, deconstructed or, or deconverted and it is a very unpleasant thing to think about. And I, I think in my own process with uh, my deconversion was coming to a point where I'm, I'm now seeing a lot of suffering and like disasters, emergencies, a lot of death that should not be the way that they are. Um, and I'm seeing a lot of that at the, at the hands of other humans who are doing things to cause that to happen. And I think in my own deconversion, I've, it's, it's made me a lot more angry that those things are happening because of the fact that I don't think there's anything after this for them. I, I think that their suffering wasn't necessary. And there are a lot of unhappy feelings, a lot of distressing feelings that I get about that. And it's kind of led me to like fight harder uh, for people and to make that kind of difference in my community and, and in my job. And it doesn't take away the things I'm thinking about. It doesn't take away the nagging feeling or it doesn't take away the distress um, that people had suffered unnecessarily. Um, and that's all still there. And, and I just want to say that you might not, those feelings might not ever go away for you. Um, but the goal is to manage them, but to manage them in a way that is realistic. And if, if that, if, if religion is something that you believe in right now, like, and that's something you honestly believe in, that's one thing. And that's something to, to continue your, your journey with and, and investigate why you believe what you believe but if if religion is something that you're holding on to because it dampens the the distress from these lingering questions then i encourage you to to not reach so hard for something to dampen those feelings and maybe kind of explore those more and that's my alarm i apologize to everybody my cat is in the other room and i have to remember to not let her be stuck in there. Um, but I, I think that there's there's a lot of feelings here that are like they're valid. They're valid feelings. And I just don't want the goal to be to just get rid of the feelings at the expense of what is true. Um, and I think I want some more time to discuss this in, in more detail with you. And I think other hosts have different opinions and different thoughts of how they've managed uh, these feelings on, on their own or what communities they've had. So I, I co-sign what Richard had said about um, recovering from religion. I think that's a great organization for you to look into, but I, I also think it would be worthwhile to uh, have a chat again sometime soon. Yes, no, I appreciate you guys very much. I definitely like to call in again. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for calling in. Uh, have a good rest of your Sunday. Um, we're running short on time. We've got another person in the queue. Do you want to see if we got a couple minutes to? Yeah, let's take them. Let's, uh, All right. Yeah. We're not going to have as much time for this one. So um, if, if we run out, we can uh, try again a different week. But we have Joseph, he, him from North Carolina. It sounds like you want to talk about bringing together groups of very uh, different worldviews. Um, can you give us a, maybe a, a concise summary of your question? Uh, yeah, I uh, work for a government organization and have about uh, 60, 65 employees. And they come from 
wide, varying backgrounds all over the world, different belief systems. Um, and as new policies or things come out, there's ripples that'll echo across the organization. Uh, and, and sometimes people get really upset um, with each other, people that they, they agreed with and were friends with the week or month before, and then they're at each other's throats over what I think personally are small issues uh, that break faith from the, the common decency that people should have with each other. And uh, it's a real struggle to get people on the same page sometimes because of these deep held, uh, religious and other beliefs. Yeah. I think, uh, I've been in a position before, not currently, but in my previous job, I was a manager and I had a, a, t a team, I'd, I traveled to different centers, had a, an array of different people from different backgrounds. Uh, some teams were large, some teams were small. The most of them were very diverse. Uh, and I think, the way I'd, I'd handle anything like this when it came up in my workplace was to remind them that they are at work and that they are, there are certain standards they have to adhere to regardless of their personal opinions. And, you know, if somebody, if somebody carries on and, and is really upsetting someone else or is being really vocal about these opinions, it, if, if you are in a position to do so, it might be worth taking them to one side and kind of just reminding them that you have standards and policies which should be adhered to and they're not acting in a professional manner. Uh, and, you know, that they should be because they're at work. And what they, what they believe in their personal life and what they do in their own time is separate to how they represent themselves in the workplace when they're representing the organization that they work for. Ben? Yeah, definitely. I, I agree with all of that. Um, there are certain things that should not be talked about at the workplace, um, and especially if people have uh, unpleasant views about other people or um, very targeted beliefs, they should not be voicing those at the, at the workplace. Um, so that's, I, I agree. I think taking them to the side, having the conversation, um, if they are unwilling to do that, then they, you know, need to think about if they're wanting to keep working there. Because I know a lot of places that can be grounds for uh, for termination if people aren't professional. So, any oh, other uh, points about that? Still there, Still Joseph? This. Um, and I'm not hearing anything. So, no, uh, all right, Joseph, if I'm going to stop the call then. Um, thanks for calling in, Joseph. I hope that answered your question. Um, if you have more kind of to respond to that, we'd be happy to take your call uh, next time um, that we're on uh, so we can continue more of that. Um, and, and to everybody in the audience today, um, I know there are a lot of, a lot of people that uh, got their calls in and we had some really good discussions on here. I wish that you all called earlier in the show because yeah. like this is kind of the trend that people will all try to get in at the very end and then we don't have as much time to, to answer every question. So um, try to, like if you've got something you want to call in about, call in even before the show. Uh, when the lines open um, or at the beginning of the show, those are great times to call in because then uh, we have we have a lot of time to to discuss with you. So um, there will be today. We're going to have uh, a Discord after show in the ACD Discord. So um, there's the tiny.cc link on the screen there. Tiny.cc/acd Discord. Or if you have a Discord account and you're part of that group, you can go um, there as well. Um, Richard and I will both be making an appearance today over there. Um, and just a reminder for everybody, uh, the prompt for this week's Talk Heathen to me is, what was the sin that made God flood the earth? And if you have a good response, put it in the comments after the show. 
and we'll read the top three answers in next week's episode. Um, and to wrap up the show, we're going to throw out some love rings to everybody in the audience. Yeah. Especially our wonderful callers, not so much the less than wonderful ones. Uh, <laughs> uh, I also <laughs> want to say just before we wrap up, that when I made the comment about uh, – uh, 80 to 85 percent of our sensory perception coming into our eyes. I did get a message backstage from Jamie the Blind Lime. <laughs> so <laughs> just uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let you ponder on what that message <laughs> might have been. And uh, uh, I won't be hosting the show next week, but I will be joining J Mike on the Atheist Experience. So if you want to see more of me next week, watch the Atheist Experience at 4:30 p.m. Amazing. Um, so go to the Discord afterwards if you'd like to um, have a chat with us. And if you don't believe, this is your community. We appreciate everybody here. Um, even if uh, you don't laugh at our jokes, it is okay. You're still welcome in this community. Um, and if you do believe, we don't hate you. We're just not convinced. See you next Bye, time. Want the truth? So watch Truth Wanted live Friday at 7 p.m. Central. Visit tiny.cc/yttw and call into the show at 512-991-9242, or connect to the show online at tiny.cc/calltw.